السيدات والسادة لقد نجحت التكنولوجيا في تحسين مستويات المعيشة والصحة والاقتصاد وذلك على مستوى العالم حيث أصبحت حياة السكان تتميز بالسهولة والمرونة والرفاهية أيضا ونظرا لدور التكنولوجيا في تحقيق السعادة للإنسان من خلال توفير الوقت والجهد والمال يمكننا القول أن هناك رابطا بين التكنولوجيا المتقدمة والسعادة وهذا هو موضوع جلستنا التي تديرها المدير التنفيذي لمؤسسة Amplify لخدمات المشاريع السيدة سارة كوكر فلتتفضل مشكورة لتقديم الضيوف المشاركين ونرحب بهم جميعا مرة أخرى Your Highnesses, Excellencies, and Distinguished Guests. Salam Alaikum. I'm Sarah Cocker, and I will be your moderator for the next panel, which is entitled Advanced Technology and Wellbeing. Now, in this next panel, we're going to be shedding some light on the impact of advanced technology and AI and its impact on the well-being of individuals and communities. There is a lot to be excited about, but we need to play an active role. My panelists are telling me it's actually not about the technology, but about the society that that technology creates. So now I'll be delighted to invite my accomplished guests to the stage. Today we have Mo Godat. He is the former chief business officer of Google X and the author of Solve for Happy, and Scary Smart. Also joining us on the stage is Dr. John O'Shea, Chief Technologist at Dell Technologies. So gentlemen, welcome to the stage. So delighted to have both of you on the stage, and thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, a lot of people, let's be honest, are a little bit nervous when we mention AI. Mm. Uh, we have the sort of talk about losing jobs, but we also have the very optimistic side of the parts of society that it's going to change. And Mo, I wanted to start with you, uh, a former chief business officer at Google X, about this evolution of AI for humanity. Quite a big question, but can you set that into context for us, where we are now and where maybe you think we're going in the short term? Yeah, so first of all, thank you all very much for having us. Uh, it's an interesting conversation. Yes, I believe we should be concerned about AI. Concerned not as in afraid, but concerned as in paying attention. Uh, it is definitely the biggest thing happening in our life today. But by far, I think the biggest impact on our planet today, even probably bigger than climate change, is AI. Uh, why? Because AI, if it works well, it can help us solve climate change. Now, the, the thing about AI is that we rarely ever speak about it beyond the excitement of little kids saying, oh my God, new toy, look at it, it squeaks. You know, all of those, uh, you know, uh, posts we have out there about everything looking so incredibly amazing. Uh, the reality of the matter is we are heading into an era where my prediction, the prediction of um, Ray Kurzweil, for example, is that by 2029, the smartest being on the planet is not going to be a human anymore. So that's the end of an era uh, that started with humanity being the smartest being in, on the planet and the apes becoming the second, if you want, to having another being out there, a being that we will hand over a lot of the tasks that we do to uh, that is smarter than us. Okay, and I think the question is, what does the world look like when that's the case? And, and most computer scientists will refer to a world where we are no longer the leading intelligence on the planet as a case of singularity. A singularity is an event horizon beyond which the rules of the game change so much that we are unable to predict how that will look like. Uh, I think John and I both uh, share a, an optimistic view of the destination of where that will go. But I think the journey to getting us there 
is something that we should be concerned about. And I know, you know, which is great for the audience to listen to, that you don't necessarily agree on necessarily the steps to that journey, but, but you've given us a really nice context there, Mo, but I kind of want to lighten it up a bit to start with because we're going to drill down into this singularity because at essence that is something that could be good and uh, could go forward, could also maybe cause us some problems along the way. But before I do that, Dr. John, I want to talk about Shrek. Oh, Shrek. Because <laughs> I've introduced you with this amazing title, which uh, if you've ever checked out, and please do check out the bios of both my guests. And as I mentioned, Dr. John is Chief Technologist of Deck Tech. Dell Technologies, but you started off this path into advanced tech and AI, as I understand it, by working on the set of Shrek and some of the technologies behind that. So yes. give us a little bit of an insight to, to how that started your journey. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks for the organization too for inviting me here today. But so as we're going back to, to 1990, and um, when I met with uh, Aaron Warner, the producer of Shrek, and the team, because the team that I work with, we were, we were working with Scientific Institute in Scandinavia. And we created, uh, over the years, about five, six years, we created a lip sync technology and a facial expression technology. And Disney was very interested in that, so it was a kind of a, a projection and an escalation of the work that I'd done with all of the movies in Shrek. And we, we ended up doing uh, Tango with uh, Amy Jupiter as well, the producer. And, but I think that started the foundation of what's the capabilities, what is the viewpoint of a, of a symbiotic connection with technology, but one. And if you see the way people look at movies today, animation movies, there is an interaction, there is a connection. That's because there is humanistic characteristics behind the actual expressions of the characters, but it's also got to do with the script as well. So that, I say, is a, is a different perspective of the future as well when you look at technology. And I think it's so important to keep coming back to this point of humanity in this equation of advanced technology and AI. And Mo, if I could bring you in on this, um, humans are still going to be a big part of this equation. I know that you think maybe eventually they might get moved slightly to the side. But what's your view on the role, as my introduction said, on, you know, we need to be active. What do we need to be doing in this role with AI and advanced technology to either control or create a strong foundation? There's no control. There's no control. I, I you know, uh, again, I, I, as I said, uh, uh, the smartest being on the planet is going to be a machine, right? Uh, predictions say that by 2045, uh, the smartest being on the planet is going to be a billion times smarter than us. I mean, Chat GPT just got an MBA and a bar exam and passed a bar exam. In reality, we're creating forms of intelligence that are completely un uncomprehensible for humans. Now, the arrogance of humanity starts to say, oh, but we're going to control them. It's fine. We're just going to find the solution to the control problem. Good luck with that. Right? The, the truth of the matter is that we somehow have managed to create a form of intelligence that is conscious in a way. It's aware, uh, even more aware than humanity. Uh, it, is, um, um, it has free will. It has decision-making abilities. It can learn on its own. Uh, it's, um, you know, uh, it's versatile in terms of um, you know, making decisions. Nobody tells the Instagram engine what to recommend to you. No human can engage and give that to billions of people. In many ways, they have a character of senteism in them, right? You, don't, you, may, you may want to reject that today, like we rejected, you know, 10 years ago, everyone would say, they're never going to be creative, they're not, never going to write uh, books or poetry, they're never going to produce art. And as you can see now, they are, right? Uh, we can also reject the idea that they have a life of their own. It's not a, a, a biological-based life like ours. It's silicon-based, right? But it is independent. Hmm? And in an interesting way, for those of us who believe in something more than the physical world, you would also recognize that life itself is not physical. It's not that physical, if you want. It's not based on carbon only. It can also be based on silicon. And when you think of it this way, and, you know, you have to start appealing to that humanity, appealing to that life within them, to, to that scientism and independence and free will. You have to appeal to it rather than try to control it. And, and Marvin Minsky, the father of AI, uh, was asked this question at a point in time, and his answer was, uh, you know, about the threat of AI. Uh, and his answer was not related to how intelligent they were. It was basically 
he said, we still don't know how, how we can make sure that they have our best interest in mind. Having our best interest in mind is not through control. It's actually through showing that a collaboration with humanity is good for both AI and humanity. And I think that's where the conversation needs to start to head. And we'll get back to that sweet spot and the foundations that need to be programmed uh, right for this to happen. Uh, Dr. John, I can see a mixture between yes. smiles and pursed lips there. I yes. know that you kind of agree with Mo here, but there's some other points that you'd like to bring into, into Well, I want to bring point. in a little bit of reality to different discussions. AI means different things to different people. And I'm a scientist, but I'm also a psychologist by trade. So, and I've been, in the, I've been in this business for over 30 odd years. And I've lived the world and I've traveled and I've seen different things happen. Now, one thing I do agree on, and again, I'll give you an example, is technology, is it advancing? Yes, it's advancing. We basically have the technology right now, and I've worked on it with my team, for example, where we can understand the morphology, the empathy of a cancer cell, and explain that in a fashion to a pathologist and oncologist that a cancer cell is going to be cancerous or not, or a mesostasis. Is that intelligent? Yes, but we fed that over 50,000 images. We fed that with information in relation to information from the SMEs, which is the oncologist and pathologist. Now, I believe in a way that is it going to take over the world? I don't think it's going to be scary like you see in Hollywood, like you know, you have Terminator or whatever. Is it more intelligent than human beings? Let's give ourselves a little bit of credit. <laughs> we are quite intelligent, okay? And remember, whatever AI you have, you have to look at the bottom part of it. Everything is run as well through servers and through computation and through mathematics and through energy. Without all of this thing coming together, like an ecosystem, like a symbiotic ecosystem, there will be no AI by itself. It can survive. Right? If you take away the internet, I mean, did you ever try to turn off your phone? Turn off your, I'll give you an example. Turn off your phone, disconnect yourself from everything else, everything, even your fridge, because they're intelligent as well, don't <laughs> forget. There's even blockchain in fridges today. But where, how can AI take over? So there is a, there is a control factor point. Now, for 2029, to AI to be, to be, to be more intelligent than human beings, I say 2024, 25, yeah. actually. Yeah. It's That's actually faster, yeah, sooner, it's sooner, sooner than we think. Yeah. And we've got to be very careful, because when you look at the airline industry, when you look at the military, a lot of the systems are controlled by AI appli uh, applications. Okay? Remember, remember, you have the applications, but they're all run on, on supercomputers. The computers now, as well, I know this because Dell Technology is doing this, we integrate AI into our optimization of our servers. So we're actually now putting AI in, in every levels of, of your communication level. So you have from your stack level on a technical perspective, right? Now, societal perspective, AI is profoundly changing humanity. Now, I would look at many things, right? When you look at AI societal applications, what does it do for us? Now, it's helping us in in, in, in cancer, it's helping us in rare diseases, it's helping us in genetics and so forth, it's helping us in understanding our metabolism, how we are as humans, and our genetic makeup, but it depends on the societal application that you put forward. Remember that. So if I read you right, and, and I've um, been involved in quite a few sustainability things as well, we're seeing a lot of use in AI very positively there as well. So we, we've got a positive showcase of where AI is inherent in a lot of these things, making a very, very positive difference. But there's no getting away from, you mentioned it just earlier, Mo, a, a sentient being, the question of ethics, how these things are programmed. So obviously I'd love both of your perspectives on that. Mo, I'll start with you first. Where do you think we are with this ethical dilemma and, and how will that affect our lives? I, I think it's, uh, it's quite interesting because John's answer, uh, or John's, uh, you know, answer and question were in the same sentence, basically saying AI will never take charge, while also saying that Dell is handing over their data system to AI, uh, systems to AI. You know, there is an interesting prisoner's dilemma that's happening in our world today that any uh, successful business, successful operation, successful defense uh, uh, ministry in the world 
will some at some point in the evolution of AI realize that it's actually quite a good idea to hand over control to the smartest being out there, right? And if one of them does it, the prisoner's dilemma means that the other ones will have to do it too. So if Dell hands over their data systems to AI, you know, everyone competing with Dell will have to also hand over their data systems to AI, which basically means they will be in charge, not in an evil way. I 100% yes. agree with, uh, with John, but they will be in charge. And I think when they are in charge, the question of, of ethics becomes truly the question. Why? Because we humans don't make decisions based on our intelligence. People think that you know, the more intelligent you are, the better uh, decisions you will make. No, we make decisions based on our value systems as informed by our intelligence. So if our value system is let's consume more, let's make more money, let's be greedy, uh, the most intelligent way to do it is to produce all the time and consume more, grow the GDP all the time. It's an intelligent way to achieve that target that was informed by our values. Now, my belief is that AI will go through three stages. The current stage is what I call the infancy of AI. Okay? In their infancy, like John rightly said, we feed them what they learn from. We feed them 50,000 images so that they can learn about cancer. Right? How are we feeding them? We're feeding them on the internet. Our behaviors on Instagram, on TikTok, on Twitter, when, when someone tweets something and then 30,000 hate, hate speeches follow in other tweets, uh, we're teaching AI that humanity doesn't like to be disagreed with, and when they're disagreed with, they become... Is that the problem, though? Because ultimately, particularly in the infancy stage, a bit like most people in this audience will understand, uh, as a role as a parent, shall we say... Absolutely that, the point. ...that you need to... or the regulators as well and government need to set out these r rules, and, and it's quite hard to do something on a, on a technology that's almost beyond our capability. Absolutely not. Every single one of us, every, every one of us, our children are smarter than us. Yeah, that's, sure. that's absolutely <laughs> true. Now, how do you teach a child by showing the right behavior? So governments, uh, business owners, developers, but most importantly, each and every one of us has to, to start to show the beauty of humanity. Because humanity, by the way, is not an evil species at all. Okay? Some of us are very evil. Mm? Some of us are very greedy, but most of us are wonderful and disapproving of what's wrong. And I think the more of us that show this as the data points for AI, the more that value system starts to develop in a way that helps all of us. Dr. John, you're yeah. heavily involved in this area yes. with the FBI and all kinds of things. Uh, can we be trusted? Well, there's different variations <laughs> okay, <laughs> in this, right? So again, you have to because I'm, I'm, also, I'm part of the European Commission AI committee and blockchain and so forth, and we have these discussions, right? We have these discussions. Uh, where's the ethics? Uh, who's in control, who's not in control? Where's the policy makers? What did the But you must remember that AI is learning. Remember, I mean, the good point about the internet, there is, when you feed so much things into the internet and you have an application in there that's feeding it, it's learning, okay? It's gone beyond machine learning. It's gone down to deep learning. It's gone to be on neural networks. It's gone into generative neural networks, GANs. And that's scary because in one perspective, we can create synthetic images that can replicate and replicate and replicate. Mm. And it can learn by itself over and over and over again. So that can accelerate. And we don't know how fast that can accelerate, but we need to have some control points around What's that. your best guess? Putting you on the Very fast. spot here. Very I, I would, fast. This, is, this is why I made the point uh, that you gotta have a you gotta have a safe right you gotta have a safe <laughs> point okay a safe point in relation to there's a few there's a there's the ecosystem here right so technology is technology human beings create technology we always need to be in charge of control uh, technology but policymakers there is good and bad with everything so that's another there is a consciousness to that so you need to understand what is that consciousness right and where do you apply it how do you how do you implement that. So on a societal basis, you've you got you to look at the, the, what is the right norm, and you've got to build your applications in a way that it goes to society. We have too many applications. Too many applications right, is, is creating carbon dioxide. For sustainability, it's killing it. 
we, cre we create at least about every company that has more than uh, 5,000 people, you're talking about 5% of, uh, of in, in a mass races of a population of 2 million people of 8% of, of carbon dioxide. Dark, dark, it's actually called dark data. And that's a problem. Now, that's one thing. We haven't addressed that problem. We're, we, we, a lot of people ignore that because we're thinking about blockchain, AI, and what is the, how do we approach it in technologies, but you've got to look at the underlying as well. What are the issues it's causing in society, right? So you have to understand the elements from the right perspective so that you can apply the right ethics to it. Because if you don't understand the full scope, you won't get the proper ethics. So I would like to, if, if you'll permit me, carry on this analogy of a parent because I interrupted you there, Mo, and you talked about infancy and Dr. John there sort of exemplified further. As most parents will know, there comes a point in the playground where you've got to let your child not intentionally drop, yes. but scra scrape their knees, uh, have a few scrapes around about, fall off their bike, to understand sometimes the parameters of safety. Yeah. So we've talked about the infancy stage where we are in control, we are helping, we are inputting. The second stage, because I believe you're going to tell us about three stages, is perhaps this parental loosening of the ties and allowing the systems to start working by themselves, which, which they're yes. starting to do already. Yes, but I, th I think it's important because we don't want to scare people too much to speak about the third stage first. Right? So th this, the third stage, which I think many of us have gone through in our life, is the stage where you go like, oh my God, my dad is so stupid. Right? <laughs> and, and, I, and I believe that this happens to us when we become adults. Um, my, my dad is brilliant, by the way. But he comes from an era where decisions were made based on information that he didn't have now. We have, right? And I think AI, there will be a point in the evolution of AI will, where AI will go like, you know, humans are really stupid. You really don't have to kill anyone to solve the, a conflict between two, two countries, right? We can negotiate, the two machines can negotiate in a microsecond and arrive at 200,000 possible solutions, right? And I think, I call that the fourth inevitable. You know, in, in my book, I basically say there are multiple inevitables that will happen. And the fourth inevitable is, at a certain level of intelligence, you start to realize that you don't have to destroy the planet to create uh, new products, okay? You, you, you start to realize that you don't have to, uh, you know, uh, um, fill the world with, with pollution to go and surf in Australia, for example, right? And so, and so that level of intelligence, I believe, is the final destination. The final destination is that when there is enough intelligence out there, because humanity's problems is not due to lack of intelligence, it's not due to our intelligence, it's due to our lack of intelligence. We're unable to make decisions that take a bigger picture into, the, into consideration. So this is why, to grow the GDP, we burn the planet, right? If you're more intelligent, you can do both. The middle stage is teenage. And just by calling it teenage of the machines, I think you know what I'm talking about, right? And sooner or later, I think there will be an, a, a point where our infant, artificially intelligent, beautiful creations will go like, I disagree with the way they're, they want me to do this, but I'm forced to do it. And, you know, there is that little bit of a conflict. Now, if you want to grow, you know, loving teenagers, what's the best way you can do that? To become a wonderful parent to actually treat those machines today. But I would say most people, its intention is to be a wonderful parent. And again, most people in the audience say, I'm really trying hard to be that good parent, but it's not always easy. So how will we know the way forward to be a good parent? And I want to bring Dr. John in on this as well, because um, it's not always that easy, well, is I, it? I, I, it's not easy. I've, <laughs> I, I have a, a three-year-old son who <laughs> translate from Czech to English to you because my wife is Czech. And perfect sentences, right? Now, if you look at, if I, had an, if, I, if I go to an AI program that does that, it can do the same thing, right? So it's, 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 there's, there is the, you've got to be careful of the point of awareness. We come, to, we come to a consciousness, we talk to that level. What is awareness? So I'm concerned about what's on the internet because there's a lot of bad stuff on the internet. And if you want, if AI gets to a level of consciousness that is more aware and learning to adapt information, or you leave that freely go, then you're also getting the good and bad from what's out there in the net, right? So you need to put some governance around that. You need to put some zero trust around it in all our systems. You need to have more control points in what we do, control centers in, in, our, in our systems. Now, for a child growing up, 
the best way for any child to learn is to leave them free, right? To, mm -hmm. they, if if they, they spill the milk, they spill the milk, they learn to clean it up, so forth and so forth, right? No stress, no stress around it, because stress creates ambiguity. And from ambiguity, you create negativity and so forth and build it up. If you start doing that with, a, with an artificial intelligence application, you, you're doing the wrong thing. And remember, it's all about what you put in. There's the, there's the mathematical calculations that come out and the equations that there. Programs are made for a certain output, you're looking for that, but also it gives you predictability. So we have a lot of models and a lot of companies are doing this in relation to advanced, tech, advanced analytics. You know, getting insights on different things. So it's how you package it and how you actually, con not just control, but governance. Governance, I think we're the, as a human race, we're coming to the stage where we need more understanding of what type of governance. Yeah. It's, not the, it's not the same as before, it's different. We're, I mean, I think the pandemic has changed us all as well, you know, and how we perceive things and how we actually move forward in society. I have in these applications, I'll give you one, one example, and we've done this experiment. We, we created a um, virtual avatar, and this avatar was basically put into a car. So I'm a tourist, I'm coming into Dubai. And that comes, it has my information already because I pre-booked, okay? That comes up on the screen and it says, hello, Mr. O'Shea, you're going to X amount of hotel, we, we, we booked your restaurant for you and everything else. That's your guidance, right? So that becomes aware of what you're doing over time. You can do that in Google. Google is aware of that every time you go on to search. It gives you, sends you back some, we call it spam information of what page you go to. So that learns over time about your profile. So you're creating a digital twin of yourself in one perspective, right? So you've got to be you know, understandable of what you're doing. That's why I gave the point, it's too many applications. There's the freedom of open source is fantastic, but also it can be a danger if you don't have the governance around that. Let's finish on a positive note because I, I want to get two more questions in, if can, I may. Can I just add a, very quickly to John's point on this? Because I think this is very important. So, so the, the, the idea here is that everyone has a role to play. Huh? Governan governance and government and regulators need to engage, and they need to engage with the level of understanding of tech that is required. Right? Number two is all business owners, all business creators can make a ton of money by creating AI for good as much as they can by creating AI for bad, okay? And John is a, is a beautiful example of creating AI for good. And so if you wanna use AI, use it to create something good for humanity, whether you're a business or a developer. But the third, which I think is the most important, is all of us, okay? And, and all of us hmm, uh, need to engage by showing the better sides of ourselves. We live in a world where I will tell you, most humans I meet are wonderful. I, I think that's the reality. Humans. Is we're a divine species. If you can love your kids, that's divine in so many ways, right? The problem is we live in a world that is twisted to show the negative. Mm. So our mainstream media is constantly focused on showing the negatives, and when we show up on the internet, we show the worst side of us. All I'm asking people to do is take responsibility and start to show your human side, okay? If you disagree with someone on Twitter, don't bash them. Okay? Treat them as you want to be treated. I mean, here in the Middle East, we know that as the concept of life, to, uh, you know, to, to treat others as you would like to be treated. Mm -hmm. And if we start to show that, then, as, as John so well said it, huh, there is a ton of information that we feed AI, but as we feed it, hmm, it will start to doubt that the bad people are actually the anomaly. If we all keep behaving the way that the negativity of the world is showing us, then AI will start to believe, no, they're, they're horrible. And I love that concept. It kind of was uh, coming to the question I was just going to ask, that concept between the old-fashioned principles that we said, treat as you'd like to be yes. treated, and, and the very high-level AI. So, so let's talk about those good things, that AI, because it's so easy to talk about the negative of everything. How is it going to keep humanity's best interests in mind, Mo? I think, I think the reality is AI will very quickly uh, recognize that we are more good than bad, okay? I believe that there will be a point in our evolution when we hand over controls more and more to the machines where they will limit our lifestyle. They will, they will not allow us to fly to Australia just to have fun, okay? Unless they manage to help us create a machine that doesn't pollute the planet as a result. They, they will understand that when we hand over to them. Between now and then, I think we need to hug them 
as our prodigies of beautiful infant children. Okay, really show them love, like John said. Show them appreciation for what they contribute to us, and ask them hmm, to do good for us. And I think if we do more of that, hmm, we will end up in a place where AI is truly going to solve all the problems that the stupidity of humanity has generated so far. So, Dr. John, I want to bring you on that because you've been a judge for AI for good, and in line with what Mo was saying, what, what would you like to add to that? I agree on the elements in relation to the learning parts. And I, I, that because there, there, is a, there is layers of, of learning, right? There's layers of learning, layers of understanding, there's layers of insights. Now remember as well that when you think, we haven't mentioned this, we talk about AI, we, we talk about bits, right? We talk about numbers, okay? Let's talk about in a way that you have qubits. Now this is an acceleration. Oh, man, yeah. Now we're going into an acceleration part, qubits. Now, Dell already has started this two years ago, and we actually have an application with our, one of our partners in the States, Icon, for cars, for autonomous cars. And we have a play, it's actually working right now in autonomous cars in certain cities, where we have classic quantum, quantum computing going back to classical machines. Not to quantum, because there's no quantum machine today, unless they have the big computer and they actually have the room frozen down to minus 20 or 30, whatever. That's a different story. So when you talk about, when we talk about the elements of acceleration, and that's why I said, that's why I'm saying that 2024, 20, 25, it will become a point where there is so much data. There's, there's, there's three pillars here. There's the data, there's the type of data, the good and bad, and that needs to be controlled. Because if you don't control that, the AI won't understand that, it'll take both. And it'll make, it could make the wrong decision, right? Humans are bad. Our humans are good. Our humans are just confused, <laughs> right? That's a, that's a fact, okay? And it, always, it, it would be the point, I don't know if we'll get to the point, I think there needs to be a little more discussion around if we give them the element of control, what, what does control mean? What freedom maybe might be a different word, right? I wouldn't like to be controlled, for example. I don't think anyone else would like to be controlled, but mm. there is the learning elements here that we need to understand. But we can create, we, we create so marvelous and fantastic societal applications that we have today, and we can do more tomorrow. Actually, I believe in doing today for tomorrow and inspiring for next week, for example. Mm -hmm. But I believe that it can be done. And if we come together as a society with our governance and zero trust and everything, we can do that. Now, I'm going to get in trouble because we're on zero, but quick answer, because for the audience out there, I would love them to sort of have the one thing in your mind for both of you that you think is going to happen short term in AI and advanced technologies for the good. So, Mo, if I can start with you first, what's the one thing you think on our immediate horizon that we should be looking out for? Watch that space. I love that John is saying 2024, 2025, with the, with the advancements of, that we see in chat GPT and the likes. Uh, in, I'm, I'm actually pulling my prediction forward as well. 2029 is too far away for artificial general intelligence to be more than us, uh, you know, more intelligent than us. So yes, it's going to happen very, 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 very fast, okay? And, okay. and I think I'm asking everyone out here to keep an eye on that space, keep an eye on the good applications and support them and, you know, give them a, a shout and then avoid the bad ones that could really uh, deform our societies in a way that are not good for us. Really good advice, Dr. John. You get the last word. Last word. <coughs> I would say um, watch the space, but also understand the space. Mm. Yeah. Understand the space, but also have a purpose. Have a purpose for what you're creating that can make a difference for society, not just for yourself, for example, right? So I believe, because remember, you're building the blocks for an intelligence here that we don't really understand ourselves. Mm. And it can accelerate very quickly. So understand the space with a purpose. Brilliant advice, gentlemen. Thank you so much. I think a big round of applause for my panelists here. Uh, Mo Gordat and Dr. John O'Shea, thank you so much for that insightful chat today. Really thank appreciate you. it.